The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Four Center podcast feed, and this episode is one of our deep dives. We're going to dive deep into when Star Wars is snowy. More on what the hell we mean by that in just a moment. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm Ken Epsock, and actually, I'm pretty excited for this. I'll explain why. <laughs> Excellent. So much great stuff is coming up in just a moment. But first, we want to let you know that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash four center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. We are continuing to recommend Tempest Runner by Kevin Scott. This is another adventure in the High Republic series, giving you a peek into one of the big villains. So if you're interested in that audiobook, you can download it today by going to audibletrial.com slash four center for your free audio book. But Ken, that is not all. Not all. Indeed, we have another offer from our friends at Inside Editions, publisher of a ton of great Star Wars books, and they're offering 35% off across their website if you use this special link, insideditions.com slash discount slash FC35. This week, we're recommending the Inside Editions book, The Secrets of the Sith, Sheev's Burn Book. Again, use the link insideditions.com slash discount slash FC35. Yeah, dig into the Sith for the holidays. So uh, mm. speaking of the holidays, it is in many parts of the world. <laughs> the uh, winter season, the snowy season, and it really just got me thinking about, you know, celebrating the winter months by talking about snow and snow and ice planets in Star Wars. Uh, starting with Hoth and then going all the way through to Muldo, Kreese, and the Mandalorian, snow and ice planets are just such a big part of the galaxy. And we're going to discuss what they mean to us, how they contribute to the thrill, the aesthetic, uh, the great cold weather gear in Star Wars, and just how all of the uh, snow and the ice uh, adds to the actual meaning of Star Wars. So, Ken, I want to start with um, with our journey we both started with the original trilogy. So Hoth is a fundamental part of Star Wars to us. What did Hoth mean to you as a kid? Mm, mm, this is why I was so excited. <laughs> we, you know, behind the scenes, when we're spitballing our deep dive ideas, sometimes, you know, like any brainstorming session, it could be like, uh, what Star Wars serial did we cry over? Uh, no, nah, that doesn't work. <laughs> and then you touched upon this one, and I got really excited because Hoth, was huge for me in a large part because I grew up on Tatooine. Um, <laughs> at least I could get to Tatooine. Uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh Beach, California, as I, said, as I said before in other shows. But if you don't know, uh, Central Coast of California, about three hours north of L.A., big beach, big sand dunes. That you could actually drive cars on uh, a little less than you used to back in the day. But we can also go play them. So I used to take my Kenner figures out there and just recreate uh, scenes from Return of the Jedi or create my own Tatooine scene. So I think because I had sand, which I actually legitimately – do not like because it gets everywhere. <laughs> I saw that quote in a lot of different ways. Anakin is not wrong about his actual <laughs> sand observations. Not wrong. Uh, because of that, I was obsessed with Hoth. Spent a lot of time thinking about Hoth. Spent a lot of time thinking about what would I do on Hoth? And the battle itself is huge. And we've discussed some of the big moments in that. We'll bring them up again, I'm sure. So what, is it, what does Hoth mean to me? Oh, Joseph, it means my childhood and my awe at this giant galaxy and a world that I uh, don't get to go to all the time. Yeah, so uh, this is this is part of the thing that I thought would be so fun is that you grew up, as you say, on Tatooine, uh, and I grew up in uh, largely in Minnesota, briefly lived in Portland, Oregon. But that actually gave me even more perspective because, like, some of the kids there were like, snow isn't real, is it? <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, it very much is. Uh, and then I went back and uh, lived most of my life until I moved here to Los Angeles in uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, uh, for the most part, in particular. And if anybody isn't familiar, uh, there are huge swings in uh, Minneapolis and in, in Minnesota. That part of the Midwest gets incredibly hot and humid in the summer, like, you know, 90 degrees and you feel like you were swimming to walk through the air because it's that thick. Uh, so it, then it goes from that extreme with just like a slight wink and a wave to the concept of spring and fall. And then you are into very cold, sometimes just hoth levels of snow. So I grew up with uh, hoth levels of snow in different parts of the year. Um, and I was 
I, that will inform some of my perspective. But first, mm -hmm. I want to ask you how you what your relationship was to snow outside of Star Wars. Like, mm -hmm. did you go and visit anywhere that was snowy? Did you <laughs> did you know yeah. snow was real? I did. I did. But it's funny you mention that because, I, I mean, I went for a very long time in my life knowing people that had never seen snow. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, and, and it, and it could, it, you know, that's, there's a lot of circumstance to it. I didn't fly on an airplane until a little bit later in life. Cause my family and I just, we, we didn't travel. We couldn't afford to travel. So it's all a journey. It's all our perspectives, it's all entry points. But yeah, I was, was blessed to go uh, uh, about once a year for most of my uh, childhood to a place called Green Valley Lake, which is up in the San Bernardino mountains. So if anyone's heard of like Arrowhead or Big Bear, between them, roughly between them, at the highest point in those mountains that, like, there's a city, is a place called Green Valley Lake. My great aunt, great aunt and uncle live there. And often we'd always be there around Thanksgiving. And they're just, we, you know, tremendously snowy nights. We once, our, our Volkswagen van almost went off the side of the hill on black ice. Our Subaru station wagon got stuck in snow that was higher than the tires of the car. So um, I had uh, a lot of experience with snow. Uh, and a healthy respect for it, on, particularly on the night when our Subaru just stopped moving and I thought we were there for the rest of our lives. So I had a little breakdown at eight years old. Um, <laughs> but then I'd go back down the hill and then it would be like, hey, um, you know, uh, we'll see you next year. Go back to the sand. Right. And, and did you like snow because it was a thrilling sometime friend? Love it. <laughs> and now, now, would I want to go live in Minnesota? Uh, I mean, it sounds like a great spot place to be, but eh, probably not. Um, uh, I loved uh, dancing with the snow and and then uh, then being able to, I guess, leave it behind. But I, I'm a cold weather person. And where I grew up, I, the beach, I mean, we, it was really cold, foggy. And, you know, most of the time it's right there. You get that beach weather. But yeah. So therefore, the snow became kind of this mythical, romantic thing for me to think about. And, and then when I would see Hoth, it just maybe it tied into those those feelings of once a year getting to go experience that. So it did it did inform my love of Hoth. Yeah. Did you play Hoth when you went up there for vacation? Did you did you like want to either like literally act it out or just even in your imagination? Uh, I I yes. Um, played maybe even more Endor because obviously it looks more like Endor than than, than Hoth. Um, but even then, obsessed with the snow and obsessed obsessed with snow gear. We're talking mm. about that. Uh, obs obsessed with snow troopers, everything about Hoth, the snow, and, and just that um, that weather change in Star Wars. Yeah, I, I would. Uh, it would be part of my uh, a daily imagination, particularly when I was inside the family uh, house, supersized uh, uh, cabin. Um, that uh, you'd look out at the snow from a nice, warm interior. Yes, which is nice. And uh, this is my final snow question uh, for. Uh, not for the podcast, because it'd be a very short podcast, but about your particular relationship to it. When you went up there, was it around the holidays? Is, did you say that? Yeah, always around Thanksgiving. Always around Thanksgiving. Always around Thanksgiving. And was the snow generally pretty pristine and, and clean still? Yeah, we would get a lot of it. Uh, yes, yes, it would. And then and then uh, it would refresh every night and morning. Like it was, you know, on the nights. And there were sometimes, of course, there was no no snow at all or a light dusting. Right. But yeah. Um, so, and I was only there for about three or four days. So then when the snow would start to die, I was already down the hill. Okay, that's great. So you did get to see some really like holiday time storybook, peaceful, beautiful snow. Yes, yes. <laughs> I did though quite, there was always snow by the side of the road. There would be like, mommy, why is that snow got uh, like oil in it? You know? <laughs> yes, oil or uh, yes, as uh, one of my uh, friends uh, would say uh, that the, uh, the puppy flowers bloom in the spring when the snow melts. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, for me, that connection to Hoth was pretty amazing because from being a very young age to a much older age, it made some of the really difficult parts of Minnesota winter, there was this glimmer of fun, right? Because mm -hmm. there'd be a lot of times from uh, youth uh, all the way up to uh, <laughs> relatively recent times of, you know, the snow hasn't been shoveled yet, but you got to get to where you're going and you're trudging. And it's just like Luke walking where you just, you feel like you're wobbling with every uh, footstep, but you just got to keep going forward. And just having that little bit of fantasy from Star Wars to make this otherwise uh, difficult uh, thing fun. Uh, one of the, the strong memories I have of like, I'm glad I have Hoth. <laughs> mm -hmm. to help me out there was a new year's uh and at this point we lived in a uh, uh northern part of minnesota kind of middle of the state uh the town was called saint joe mm -hmm. and uh the the i didn't understand what was happening but some uh, gas pipe burst in our house and 
we had to go to the pizza place to <laughs> not die. It was basically like we uh, we think it's still open. It's New Year's. We got to go to the pizza place so we don't die. Uh, but it was like below zero. Like your skin can't be exposed yeah. very long. Um, right. And it, uh, I always got wrapped up a lot for the cold, but this was like. Mm-hmm they gave me the Luke scarf (laughs) and it was wrapped around my face. So it was just my eyes. And it was that like true brutal. Like you feel like the, the wind is like, uh, I guess you're out here cause you want to die. So I will, (laughs) I will uh, do my service to you and and murder you immediately. Uh, and that I, you know, I, I I was able to get through that scary thing. Cause like I'm being like Luke Skywalker now. I was going to say, it was, it, 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 was there a, f- a healthy fear of what happened to Luke and his Tauntaun and Han and his Tauntaun or an inspiration or a bit of both? It was a healthy fear for sure. Like, keep moving because, you know, Han's not coming. Han's not going to take me to that pizza place. <laughs> uh, and then over the years of, you know, when I really started to watch Empire Strikes Back a lot because I finally had it on crappy uh, pan and scan VHS, mm. that shot where Luke finally collapses, right? And he kind of, he wobbles a little bit and then he just face plants. Yeah, it, yeah. It's just like, yes, that is walking in the snow. <laughs> you're, just, you're just done. <laughs> I found that so relatable and still do. Uh, yeah. So, uh, as adults, uh, what do we think is the storytelling importance of Hoth? We talked a lot about our, our youthful connections to it and to our, the real physical world, but inside the story of Star Wars, why is Hoth? <laughs> why is Hoth? I, I think it, it, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, from where they go from New Hope to now, and you could just look at it as, yeah, look, they wanted a different environment. We spent a lot of time on the sand in New Hope. Let's go to something entirely different. But how that just also just works for... Um, the rebels and the rebels going to the far reaches of the galaxy, going to a place is, uh, you know, it ain't, it ain't a dream of spring out there. They're not having fun. It's the winds of winter. They're stuck there. Um, and that's how far they need to go to survive. And then that doesn't even keep them there. And it's so cold and distant and dangerous. Um, this isn't a, a time of celebration and, and, and you're coming <laughs> out of uh, the Death Star blowing up medals and, uh, being handed out and rounds of applause what a great time. And here you are. And it ain't the same. And I just still think that uh, is a great thematic uh, backdrop. Yeah. I I'm so with you. I think it, it absolutely does show a larger galaxy from a new hope immediately. Right. Uh, it taps into that sort of a uh, fantasy, uh, you know, you crack open Lord of the Rings and anything else. And it's got the desert lands and it's got the ice lands and it's got the swamp lands. Right. And, uh, Empire Strikes Back immediately starts, uh, you know, expanding the palette and including all those kinds of environments. Uh, so it expands a palette of what what Star Wars can be, makes the galaxy bigger immediately. But then, yeah, just communicates the absolute desperation of the rebel base of like, we have to hide out where no one would ever choose to live, where in fact... <laughs> the weather wants us to die. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And it, other cre- there are creatures here we don't even know or understand because it is so remote <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that it has not even been fully charted. We don't even know what that thing is that attacked Luke, right? Yeah, right. Everything it about it. Stuff. Yeah, it just it communicates desperation. And I was so scared of the Wampa. And I've told you, I, I do, I've now, I love the Wampa. I collect Wampa uh, collectibles, but like I was terrified that as a kid, as a kid, they would just pop out of the snow. It was so dangerous for the Rebels to be there. <laughs> yeah, it's so dangerous because they just didn't understand anything. And then I think as I've gotten older too, there's just like, there's just utter pain for me. I think um, in particular, having myself worked for some, you know, nonprofit organizations or very small for profit startups that are just trying to get by. And for me, like just the the infrastructure tragedy <laughs> of Hoth, where they're they're trying to like they they can't be and they, they can't set up their office in a good space, so they set it up in this janky space to the best of their ability. The second they have it set up, like they got to leave all their space laptops behind. How many USB cables did they lose? Just desperately running out there. They just got set up. They didn't ha- they didn't launch any missions from Hoth, right? I mean, maybe they have right. an expanded cannon, but that's not the vibe of Empire Strikes Back. Like, great, we got oh, ourselves no. a base. Let's go. No, in fact, I remember being particularly perplexed and frustrated with the fact that the speeders, you know, couldn't adjust to the cold. And I just remember as a kid being like, but how long have you been here? Like, did you know this? You know, <laughs> not picking up on the desperation that uh, drove them there and then drove them away. 
It really does have that vibe. Like we 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 can't uh, get the fax machines to convert to this current of power. Oh, it's we're in such a weird place. Absolutely. Yeah. So I I love it from that perspective as well. So did the sheer volume of Hoth scenes that you could find in video games as you grew up and became a young adult, did the amount of Hoth in video games add to or detract from your love of of that location and the idea of snow in Star Wars? Uh, I really help think help think it helped lock in that mythic feel uh, of, of the Hoth sequence of of um, the walkers, the danger, the fear, and the excitement of it all, and it became the shared love and, and that thing I always talk about of we all have that sh- shared unique uh, 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 journey through Star Wars as fans. Like that is one of those things. Like on the playground, I thought, am I the only one that loves Hoth and that Hoth battle? And, of course not. Uh, and then the video games come out and it's like you get to reenact this over and over and over because that's what we all daydreamed about. It just made Hoth even that much more of a myth. Yeah, it just made it more epic, right? Uh, mm-hmm. did, did playing the battle or versions of the battle, did that change your relationship with the battle itself? Uh, I think it made me even appreciate it even more because in, 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 in truth it's it's a short sequence right it's like it's not um uh, it was made during a, a different time and it's such a good sequence but like you know it's not like uh um yeah i'm not even trying not even star wars examples but like any other kind of uh you know from game of thrones to lord of the rings to kingdom of heaven or any kind of like long drawn out medieval battle sequence hoth isn't that it's it's pretty quick once it gets going it's kind of over and the rebels get their asses kicked and they have to go um but to be able to slow it all down and just spend more time, learn the layout of the Echo Base a little bit, I'm still fascinated with that. And I remember even on, um, on uh, you know, uh, the, the 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 first one there, the um, the 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 game that we all, the Shadows of the Empire, when you could kind of get out to the other side, the back garage, I called it. <laughs> I just you know whether or not that layout is canon or still or something, I don't yeah. know. Don't really even care. It doesn't matter. I just I remember walking out, going, "Oh, that's where it was. Oh, I got it." It just it just continued to just make the the whole sequence that much uh, like you said epic. Yeah, yeah, I think that that uh, you know battle scene is so powerful. Great contrast to a New Hope, but then lots of battles that we've seen to have it in this this kind of snowy, kind of beautiful, kind of frightening, uh, you know, terrain because we we've, we've been told it's that dangerous. We know that they're fighting the cold as well as those machines that are just crunching through it and. You know, Luke's wobbly on his legs. He's running around doing his stuff there. And just everything about it is aesthetically pleasing, right? From the the look of the uh, AT-ATs or AT-ATs and the sound and everything uh, makes it really powerful. Um, I think I've had such a fun relationship with it in video games because it's, you know, for the original trilogy, one of the cool uh, Mm -hmm. battles. And I remember, you know, one of the first times that I had to figure out the mechanics of how to do the absolutely cool move there's that thing in video games when you, you feel like, ah, oh, I'm a, I'm going to get to do the thing, right? Yes, yes. And you're like, and you're in the moment and you, you're you role playing in your own head and like, yeah, this walker's going to go, ah, and then just not at all being able to master the mechanics. Yes. Oh, <laughs> of how to get the snow speeder to whip around the legs and then uh, mastering it and feeling so cool. And, you know, just like, I'm taking down walker after walker and then moving on to another video game and like, the mechanics of this one are different. <laughs> and now it's just like, I, my, I am nothing but, you know, uh, thumbs with no memory and I have to rebuild it again. Yeah. yeah. How do I get that tow cable out this time? How do I get yeah. that tow cable back? Yeah. And so it's fun to have something that is so fantastic turn into something that's like, Oh, here we go again. And yeah. I never stopped loving it because once yeah. you actually mastered it, then it's like, Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I think, uh, that, there's so many versions of Hoth that you've encountered in video games, but the most recent Battlefront, uh, the mm-hmm. 2017 one, that, that Hoth is one of my favorite levels. Running around inside the base, but also that big mission where you're trying to stop the uh, the advance of the ad ads. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It just the, it, the the graphics are so great that it captures this very particular thing with cold weather. Those moments where the sun is out and high and it is bright and glorious and the sun is just beaming off the snow, but it's all a deception because it is cold <laughs> as hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the graphic, I mean, that's in the movie, obviously, but the graphics on that is like, I live it. It feels like visiting Minnesota. It does. I even love, uh, you know, that thing they released on Disney Plus, uh, you know, the little, uh, what are they called? The flyovers that you got going oh, on. Oh, yeah. The yeah. biomes, I think. Biomes. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, that one on Hoth. I mean, they're all great. I actually really love them, but the Hoth one's my favorite because you just kind of get a bird's eye view of what's going on, and I love it even more. Again, I just love the layout, love the walkers. I'm fascinated by the Empire landing the walkers kind of far away. Tactical reasons, probably safety, but also just to like, let's let's let the, the fear build slowly. That's an outlet <laughs> for us. Exactly, exactly. So let's talk about uh, the aesthetic glory of the cold weather gear in Star Wars. For you, it, it ranks pretty high, right? You're a big fan of the cold weather gear. I am a big fan of jackets myself. This is this is one of the weirdest things all of her say. I understand. Uh, Grace thinks it's weird when I say it. Uh, I love the art of getting warm. <laughs> and I think it's a great turn of phrase because it's almost sexy, but still not. <laughs> it's still not. Uh, and, I, and you probably have a different view on it from where you were uh, raised in your point of view. But there's I'm just very curious. About, it's just something about I love being cold. And then I love trying to see what do I need? Is it a heater? Is it an extra blanket? It is it socks? Is it a beanie? What will get me warmer? And what <laughs> game can I play? And I, cause I remember I was in New York in uh, 2016, second time in, in New York, but it was really cold versus like the first time I'd been in like uh, late fall it wasn't as cold. And uh, we were doing like a collider thing. We had to walk every morning across town to this office to do our work from this, uh, the complex studios. And I've never that was some of the coldest I had experienced. And it, you would probably, as a Minnesotan, probably laugh, but I, it was, it was, it was legit cold, right? And, and I just remember not having a scarf because I never, it never factored into my art of getting warm before, and I had to buy one there. <laughs> uh, no, and I, it, I, and then I loved it. I loved it. And then you love this scarf because it was a part of your arsenal of getting warm. Yes, and then I'm not gonna lie, as here I am in my early 40s, walking to work. And I put that scarf on and put it in front of my face. I'm like, just like Luke did. <laughs> and you're able to feel cool. Yeah, yeah, no, that is, that's fascinating. Um, I think for me and my long relationship with winter gear is, uh, which relates to, to liking the weather gear in Star Wars mm -hmm. is uh, there, it, there are a lot of different approaches to the winter in the cold in Minnesota. So I don't want to make huge generalizations, right. but there is a strain of reaction to the very, very cold and the snow physically impeding your movement and cars movement uh, and everything. There is a pride in endurance that what makes you a strong and good Minnesotan, maybe a strong, good person is that you can F and take it. I love it. <laughs> and I have a strain of pride that I can endure whether that is trying to actively murder me. Um, but then there's also that like, just because you can endure something painful doesn't mean you always want to. <laughs> and there are people, you know, and it just comes down to body chemistry and like my body chemistry isn't any different from growing up there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's very funny to me to move to Los Angeles and they're like insulation. What is that? That's a right. space term from star Wars. Right. And like, if it's, 50 degrees outside in my apartment in Los Angeles, it's 50 degrees in here. And I'm incredibly cold. Yeah. 50 yeah. degrees in Minnesota, that, especially in like April, a 50 degree in April, you're getting into t-shirt weather, right? It, right. You yeah. acclimate and you change. So there's that. And just physically for me, like my body, I, I get affected when I'm cold. I get, I tighten up. I don't like it. It gets into my bones very quickly mm -hmm. and very easily. So I want to be warm. I want to follow your art of warm. Uh, <laughs> but then there's also this thing growing up is you didn't want to look dumb, right? You didn't want to look like <laughs> Ralphie, Ralphie's kid brother in a Christmas story. No. And, you know, some of the fashion that was available to look bundled up made you look weak and dumb and bulky was <laughs> like, you know, not. And I just, this is where it gets back to Star Wars. It's like, ah, if I could look as cool as Han or Luke or Leia and be all bundled up. That would be great. But in order to be bundled up, I look like a dork. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I understand. It's the mittens that get me. <laughs> it's the mittens. Uh, it would have done so much for me if Leia had mittens. <laughs> <laughs> or Han. Well, I see the Han he's pointing, at, he's pointing at Leia, that famous Han Solo fingers of giant mitten. <laughs> just a big bit that would have made i would have accepted but uh, you know silly to admit that but i would have accepted it more if han had been like uh, wearing the mittens would have been like okay okay i can i can do it yeah 
Yeah. So I, I think there were definitely times for me, like like I talked about when I was young, where it's like I have to bundle up and I have to trudge. Mm-hmm. That being able to associate that to the the winter weather gear, particularly Luke scarf, there's something about that. Like mm-hmm. it's here if I need it. I'm like okay, yeah. I need it. <laughs> well, and, and as and, uh, as as you know, um, uh, that the the Hoth Luke is the only Kenner Luke I had. Wow. Yeah. I he, I, he, I never he was got in the, the other- sand. He was in the sand. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would, I would, that was my Luke. So Hoth, Hoth Luke was on the sand looking for Java <laughs> as a kid. And so that just, that, and that was, again, why I love that sequence. So I think I sought that one out, but you know, you, as a lot of, uh, any, any listener knows, no matter what era you, you are in as a child, like sometimes toys just come to you, be, not because you got your Christmas wish list dreams come true, but like, an aunt was like, you like Star Wars. Here's an Ugnaught. You know, you're like, oh, okay. Um, and I think that Hoth one just kind of found its, Hoth Luke found its way to me. And much like I, I always tell the Y-Wing story of I didn't set out to be a Y-Wing fan. I, that's the only toy I got on the vehicle side. So I just became attached to it. I think I even became more attached to Luke because I love trying to fold that hard, not really bendable plastic rubbery <laughs> uh, scarf in front of his face. Um, to, so it all kind of adds it up, adds up too, where it's just built into my love of that uh, Hoth gear. I, I've got a love of of Luke's Hoth look, uh, partially because I coveted that action figure. The stars mm-hmm. never aligned, and I never had that Kenner figure. And See? when it came out in the you know Power of the Force two in the nineties, I was like, this this is a must have. Yeah, immediately. Yeah. Uh, now there's uh, I got uh, a one that's uh, when they're doing Black Series for three and three quarter that is like. Uh, battle damaged Hoth Luke with the cuts on his face from yes. the Wampa. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, and I have the, I have the Wampa one. I haven't I've never taken that out of the box. I don't know. I I don't know if I ever will, but I kind of want to because cause just because of that, just to have the Hoth Luke. Yeah, yeah. So I think for me it was a good message that sometime in the future uh I could uh you know, embrace the art of being warm. <laughs> <laughs> and I could wear clothes that would keep me safe and alive and still look and feel cool. And eventually I did, uh, yeah. for the most part, find uh, find winter gear, you know, mostly, you know, leather jackets and cool scarves. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I still probably uh, made some poor uh, winter weather dressing choices. Uh, I know for you, Leia, Hoth look Leia is a, is a big one. What, what is it about Leia's Hoth look that resonates with you? I've uh, yeah, I've always I've always uh, enjoyed it. There's something um, there's some just real. There's a strength and power to her in that moment. And 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 I you know seeing that movie in in my youth. There's you know I'm not making any. I'm not connecting with. Well, she was uh, you know in, in a dress the entire time in New Hope and here and here she's a little different. I I didn't. See, in fact, I saw Empire last. Um, I, I just love everything about it. And just from a weird you know aesthetic, just for me as a, as a as a you know young straight boy look it up like that's that's the leia i was found even the most cute <laughs> like to be blunt like i just love the hair up everything about it and just that fierce kind of look in her eyes as she's getting bleep done i was just always it just was built in my into my life from that point on uh so i love everything about it in fact it you know, as I remember when i had the chance to 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 moderate that panel with carrie fisher um, in 2016, a couple months before she passed away, when, when she took off her eyeglasses, when it was looking right at me, it was hot Leia looking at me and I froze <laughs> on stage just in that, like, wow, I'm looking at Leia. Like it just, and it was hot Leia that I saw looking back at me with those eyes. <laughs> that is really powerful. That is such a great opportunity that you had. And I love that story. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think, I think that it is a lot about her energy in, in those scenes where she is truly being a leader. Uh, that is a, that's practical weather gear for Leia in practical let's get stuff done mode, yeah. but it still looks cool. It still has like a cut to it. It has like that great sort of Star Wars energy to it. The it's, you know, it is basically just like a large snowsuit <laughs> yeah. uh, with this jacket uh, and the gloves. I, I think the journey that, that the Leia character is going on is so served by that look, right? That yeah. in yeah. Empire Strikes Back, she is starting with, I am, I am just the rebel leader and I'm not really listening to my emotions. I don't want to open up. I don't want to, you know, defrost at all, you know, and that's the journey that the character goes on and in the outfit uh, fits that as well as seeing like, yeah, no, that's who she is. She is a commander. She is the one who knows what's going on, who doesn't leave her post and the outfit supports that too. Yeah. And just again, you know, I wasn't super thinking about this at seven or eight, but just, you know, she goes from kind of passively sitting in the, in the command center in New Hope, hoping that things work out to, you know, being front and center. That, that was there, whether I 
consciously picked up onto that or not at eight, it was there and I got it. And that's why I think I'm always drawn to Hathaway. Yeah. And I think I had a lot of the Leia figures, but I think that's the one that I played with the most. And I, so I think that that's a little bit of the connection for me of like, yeah, that, that's Leia. Um, I also just think the the winter weather gear, the cold weather gear is so kind of important for the history of action figures. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Because obviously, as time would tell, a, a lot of times what sells is variants of the main characters, you know. And I remember getting grumpy, uh, you know, when all the Batman action figures became like, yeah, we don't need other characters. It's just Aqua mm-hmm. Batman with flippers <laughs> and he's Aquamarine yeah. now. Uh, yeah. But this was the opposite, right? Of like, the characters actually did put on different costumes in the film. And so we get new action figures, you know, narratively changed gear, uh, snow troopers, instead of just having variety for variety's sake, eh, you need different troopers because you're on a, a nice planet. That was huge for the design of star Wars and huge for the action figure market. I think. Oh yeah. I mean, you're talking about snow troopers, right? That uh, it's probably what started all of our, all of our love of different classes of stormtroopers, right? <laughs> That's why we right. can fill many podcasts on the different looks from uh, snow to shore, but those snow, <laughs> <troopers> <laughs> show, snow to shore. Uh, yeah. When they showed up, that was something different. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, along those lines, do you want to see more cold weather gear in the future? Is there somebody that you haven't seen really bundled up that uh, Star Wars character that you would like to see pursuing the art of getting warm. Uh, Ray. And, mm. and, and, and on Starkiller Base, I know we had, you know, she has Finn's jacket at one point and that kind of weird deleted chase. It's there a little bit in the film. Um, she's out of the jacket. This is someone who, you know, grew up on Jakku. I can't imagine she was feeling great on Starkiller Base. <laughs> um, and as she goes through the galaxy, uh, you know, I'm sure even, you know, in, in events that we did not see in the sequel era, uh, I'm sure at some point she's like, I'm sorry, guys. I grew up on you. It's really cold. And I would love to see just a fierce Ray snow gear outfit and give me that figure. Let's do it. I, you know, that was my same knee jerk reaction too. Cause we, we yeah. see her, uh, you know, they got the coats on, on Kajimi, right? But yes, it's just some, it's, it's fine. I'd, I'd happily buy an action figure of that, but yeah, no, I really want to see her, you know, in the, the time after rise of Skywalker, like I'm a Jedi, I'm pursuing the galaxy. I, I've got my Jedi robes that feel right to me. Ooh, I need some cold weather Jedi variants here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And see what kind of awesome, you know, Jedi action cold weather gear Ray could have is oh, fascinating. Yeah. Totally. Uh, I kind of think the speaking of the strain where you endure pain and, and take pride in it, I kind of think the Sith don't care about cold. Mm. <laughs> But at the same time, I want to see uh, Maul just bundled up in a massive Sith snowsuit. I just, I just pictured that. Have we never ever seen that even in legends or concept? I would love just a big, you know, big coat with like a like a, a black fur coming out. You know, a little puffy fur spot with some, maybe some red. No, no, some red. I take it back. Be a black coat with like the little uh, lining would be red. Like like Han's hood with the fur lining, but it's yes. bright blood red fur, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Have we never seen this? Someone is—is is it maybe in the Bane trilogy? Is someone tell me this is out there? I would yeah, I mean, I think a lot. Of, like Vader, like yeah, no, I don't need any yeah, any weather gear. Like it's understandable. Vader is not putting on a coat when he marches into Echo Base yeah. on Hoth. But yeah, but Maul, come on, come on, he's topless half the time. You're not going to put on a, a jacket. And Darth Darth Amir, it, uh, you know, see what we've seen there. A little it seems like it's real humid there. Like, yeah, I don't think he's where you used to the cold. <laughs> he is not used to it at all. Yeah. Uh, we talked about this a little bit at the top of this part of the podcast, uh, but I I have a pitch for you. I'm curious mm-hmm. if you want to see it in Star Wars. So, a late in the winter planet that is entirely covered in snurt, which is <laughs> snow plus dirt, uh, in Minnesota. I'm sure it happens in many other places, but my life experience has been. You know, people will visit during the holidays when it's just snowed recently and it's this crisp, beautiful, it's sparkling, it's refreshed. Then you get to March and it's just been there forever. And they're just like, yes, a a thousand wrappers and rough memories in this (laughs) dirty, dirty snurt everywhere. Would you like to see an entire snurt planet in Star Wars? Yes, I would love to see it actually in in like a, not corset, but like a real bustling kind of uh, city environment that also experiences a lot of snow. We've seen tiny versions of it, like, like, you know, imagine Coruscant, but not Coruscant in the snow. And we're there, you know, what, what time of year would that be? February, March? I don't know. Yeah, uh, April. 
Yeah, whatever. The, I know that there's not an April in the Star Wars galaxy, but that time, <laughs> the Star Wars galaxy, I would love that. And then just complaining, someone being like, oh, man, look at all this dirty snow in the corner. Ah, it'd be great. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I want uh, to have uh, actually uh, Sergeant Sharp uh, put his fingers in it and taste it and go, <laughs> snort. Snort. <laughs> All right. On that lovely note, we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to be back to discuss uh, all the great non-Hoth ice and snow planets in the Star Wars galaxy back in a moment. And we are back and we're going to dive into all the non-Hoth snow and ice planets uh, and some of the significant stories that happen there. So there are far more ice and snow locations, uh, particularly in books, comics, legends, uh, than we could possibly cover here. So apologies if we leave your favorite out. We're going to be looking at some of the major ones and some of our favorites. So, uh, Ken, uh, let's go to what I think is one of the biggest in the whole story of Star Wars. Let's talk Ilum and Star Killer Base. So we get to see this planet many times in many stories uh, in what is now the legends, uh, Kennedy Tarkovsky's uh, Clone Wars. Uh, we see it in the great gathering arc of the main Clone Wars animated series as the source of the Jedi's kyber crystals. Uh, what's the importance of this sort of Ilum side of it, the uh, kyber crystals being uh, generated on this ice planet? What is that importance in meaning or aesthetic? Why is it that way? I just, it, it's, it's such a beautiful, again, kind of mythical fantasy kind of location, ice caves, something different. It really adds to it. You could have put those kyber crystals anywhere, and I think it would have worked for the, the theme of what the kyber crystals are, are. But, I mean, I don't know. It reminds me of, like, Narnia or something. You know, it's just like this real, like, we've all been through the wardrobe and come out on the other end on Elam. And I just always loved the way it looked and, and even kind of forgot that, you know, a lot of that, you know, the, the Tartakovsky stuff kind of introduced some of that. The gathering arc is, is wonderful, a wonderful arc, but um, it's a, it's a winter wonderland in a weird way. So it's like, we're at the North pole of, of the force. <laughs> the North pole of the force. Yeah. I love uh, everything you're saying, really point out some great examples from North pole to Narnia mm. of the magical cold. Right. Uh, yeah. It is very, very high fantasy. Like I think I, I had a knockoff uh, choose your own adventure book when I was a kid and it was like about uh, ice mountains with dwarves, you know, it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's one of the fantasy locations is the cold place. So there's something about Ilum that does feel very, very high fantasy go into uh, the cave where you have to explore yourself in order to reveal these magic crystals is so high fantasy. But the other thing I like about it is it, it's uh, it's this great counterpoint to Hoth, right? Uh, the meaning yeah. of Hoth in that context is remote, <laughs> desolate, dangerous. You know, you're not wanted there. Um, and this is cold as nature, right? That yeah. cold doesn't mean barren. It's just another uh, place of nature. It's in fact a beautiful place. And the idea of ice and snow as crystals that then, you know, uh, blossoms into this idea of kyber crystals that makes them uh, so natural and so much just a, a part of uh, the luminous galaxy um, is really great. And you could have had them hanging from, you know, trees in a beautiful forest, but, yeah. uh, but the cold I think really is that like, it's still natural, but you have to work for it. You have to venture forward, you know? Yeah, no, I think it, it, you could, you know, without stretching too far, quite frankly, I think you could connect it to finding hope within the fear of Star Wars. Is a great warmth at the center of all that, uh, literally, physically, uh, emotionally, spiritually. You got to search for that warmth in the cold and, uh, and 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 change your views on how to deal with cold. And cold might you might immediately as a, you land there, you're like it's cold. I might die here. This is this is uh, you know this is a, a dangerous place. But no, you got to search for the warmth there, hope and the fear. Yeah, no, I really like that. And I think that ties to, you know, if you're going to have a negative attitude about cold, that it that it doesn't mean barren and lifeless. It can be yep. extremely alive, which is another great way of saying uh, what you are of uh, finding the the warmth and the hope in a place that could be cold and, and frightening. Yeah. Um, so then, of course, uh, as we is was hinted and then uh, confirmed by a video game, right? Yeah. Uh, that Ilum is converted into the horror of Starkiller base. Do you like the story of the Empire in the First Order weaponizing this uh, sacred natural planet? I really love it and hope we get even more. And Fallen Order was, uh, uh, I thought it was a very effective use of it. 
Uh, this is one of maybe the only things when you look at episode seven that I, you know, there's a, you know, you, you can, uh, we love that film uh, without a doubt, but you know, sometimes you might go, ah, the big three, Han, Luke, and Leia. We never got that scene, right? You could, you could, it's fair to ask those questions. Uh, I, 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 I just think Ilum, I was always behind the Ilum theory. And once it's confirmed, it is one of my favorite things. I just, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily need, I don't, I don't, I don't think Force Awakens needed, someone to point and go, it's on Ilum. Cause 90% of the people watching would have been like, huh? Um, so I get, <laughs> I get that. I just, I just, uh, so I'm not saying it's a missed opportunity, but there's so much to that and so much to what it means. And also connects to yeah, Palpatine, the emperor, uh, the plans, uh, and the first order picking up those plans and how connected are they? Like all that stuff is there. Plus what you're talking about, this weaponizing of this sacred, this beautiful sacred place. There's a lot to it. Uh, it all exists. It's there, even if uh, no one actually said it in The Force Awakens. Um, but uh, that's one thing I look back. It had to be clearly JJ comes up with the and, and team come up with this concept. And along the way, they go, well, we could put it on this part of the star map and it would connect to, to Ilum if, if, if you so desire. Yeah, and it would build into the story that um, that Rogue One was really putting solidly in modern canon that mm-hmm. kyber crystals powered the Death Star. So a planet yeah. that was converted into being a Death Star-like actual planet. Well, what planet would that be? Well, maybe one that is <laughs> yeah. where kyber crystals actually uh, come from, or at least one of the main sources. It all makes great canonical sense. Yeah, I think this is one of those things that is, for right now, it is just kind of true about Star Wars, and you can embrace it uh, however you want. I embrace it positively that an idea that Star Wars is often tip of the iceberg storytelling, no pun intended since we're talking about ice, uh, there isn't really like a narrative reason for us to know in Force Awakens that it's Ilum, right? Right. Yeah. But, sure. and then it and then it adds, I, I'm not saying that de- that you should have to dig for details, but that is a part of the fun that different parts of the Star Wars story mm-hmm. connect to each other. And yeah. it is kind of fun when you can go like, oh, wait, but now that I, this leaks out that, oh, it's in the same position and then it's revealed in a video game, then you can go, you can watch the Gathering Arc, the Clone Wars animated series, and now it's speaking to this big budget film, Force Awakens, right? Yeah. Uh, that for me is kind of joyful because it feels like you are reading the sacred texts, you know, yeah. <laughs> and you're discovering things. And uh, obviously, you know, pretty intense Star Wars fans such as our, ourselves and a lot of our listeners, and it's not a buried secret. It's a known thing but it still gives you that flavor of discovering something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Sorry. It's like you can make everyone always loves making the jokes about uh, Rogue One and, uh, oh, you got to read Catalyst. No, you don't have to. But when you do, man, you're certainly rewarded. And some of that was with that Ellen stuff for me. Yeah. Um, and it was also very early on in the Disney era, right? 2015. It is, is a, little bit, a little bit more fun to speculate and everything. But once it became confirmed, I was like, okay, uh, I'd still love to give me a, an Ilum uh, a sh- a short story or something set there at uh, the end of the uh, the Empire. Uh, and again, for, for Fallen Order does a great job touching on it there. But Yeah, the uh, the tragedy of Ilum, the Disney Plus show, is going to yes, be go. fabulous, I think. Uh, yeah, I just love comparing. It, it is such a great just... Uh, straightforward look at <laughs> light and dark, right? Yeah. Of you watch that gathering arc and you, it's a tradition for uh Jedi to, or, or Jedi hopefuls, young Padawans, uh, younglings to go and work with this planet, work with nature, try to communicate with the planet, try to humble themselves, uh, acknowledge and overcome their flaws in order to receive a gift that the planet is then willing to give them, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to get their kyber crystals. So going to a place, uh, humbling yourself, trying to be your best self and asking <laughs> for yeah. something versus we are going to ravage this planet and make it be something it doesn't want to be mm. in order to, you know, cement our own power. Yeah. It's yeah. so it's heartbreaking right uh but it's also just very powerful and this is what the story is you know uh take dj from last jedi and show him ilm versus star killer base and go are they the same yeah right yeah is it just one side blows up the other yeah yeah maybe uh maybe (laughs) maybe maybe he'd probably say that was a little uh trip to ilm star killer base (laughs) for dj so we do spend quality time then on the surface of ilm slash star killer base in the forest i wrote the forest awakens the Force Awakens. <laughs> you did. That's good. <laughs> how does that uh, snowy environment and knowing it's Ilum, how does it add to those scenes for you? 
well, the the forest did awaken, and I enjoyed that. It was Endor with snow for me, and uh, and now now I wish I could go back up the San Bernardino Mountains and and, and act that out as an adult. Uh, I uh, did absolutely enjoy the the mixture of it of of uh, snow often seeming to cover life, but the life springing up uh, uh, out of it, and and uh, Ray on the surface of that planet trying to discover. Um, her new life springing out of what was before. I think that all works for me. Uh, then it cracks in two and, uh, and it was just a different, different feel, but being so familiar and going back to even like the, the Kylo reveal in the teaser trailer. Remember we spent a lot of time going snow and trees. Like what do we got? <laughs> Endor meets Hoth. How is this yeah. possible? It's right? called the forest. Oh yeah. Oh, right. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, winter forest. Yeah. Uh, I have come to love that as one of my just favorite locations mm-hmm. in the films because it has such a brother's grim dark fantasy you know european myth vibe about it and i think what i like about it is you know uh it starts where where finn and ray are are you know it, they are like these kids who've gotten lost in the dark woods that they don't fully understand right yeah and they're in such a dark place and as kylo's marching in there it feels like kylo should win because he's at home right <laughs> he's yeah. the monster in this dark old wintry forest and i just love all the way the those aesthetics kind of um inform what's going on with the characters and with ray's eventual victory and then just getting into like sheer fun head cannon speculating while you're brushing your teeth there's such central stuff going on with the skywalker blade with that you know somewhat sentient kyber crystal in yeah. the hilt that had already called out to ray and then you know being fought over uh on that planet and in going to ray so that ray could take the steps that she needs to do and wondering like how, that's all happening while the blade is home you know yeah like we don't know for sure uh because we haven't in canon got the story of of anakin getting that kyber crystal uh but in theory it came from ilum so it the idea of when that when kylo's reaching for it when ray's reaching for it and it flies to ray Mm-hmm. that all of this is happening for this kyber crystal where it all began is kind of fascinating i love that idea yeah yeah it, it, it almost as if the crystal's even more in tune with what it needs uh to do or who needs it yeah yeah and i i, I do like the it's sad but i like the ultimate i like that star killer base doesn't just blow up and become space rocks i like that it you know becomes mm-hmm. this new uh, celestial object. How do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm absolutely fine with that. Because again, more storytelling. <laughs> more storytelling. Yeah. Play it's around. got a little bit of rebirth. Yeah. Yeah. You can figure something out. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on, there's a big snow episode of the Clone Wars uh, that is called Trespass uh, that is on the planet Ordo Plutonia that is home of the species Tulls. Uh, we get to see Anakin in Obi-Wan in cold weather mm. gear. Very original trilogy, cold weather gear, which you and I both lost our minds about when we covered this yeah. <laughs> on the Clone Wars report. Uh, what what does this episode do for the story of ice planets and Star Wars for you? It cements the legacy of them because this was clearly done by a group of uh, uh, creators who are and were Star Wars fans going, you know what I love? Cold weather gear on snow planets and Star <laughs> Wars. And someone goes, I thought I was the only one. And then someone says, I'd love to see Anakin kind of wearing a jacket that Han wore. And then boom, there you go. Wonderful episode, wonderful series of, uh, you know, events and arcs and everything. And in, in, in this episode, we, as we broke it down in Clone Wars report, but I, I mean, I don't even dig, need to dig below the surface. I just absolutely was like, yes, this is one thing I love in Star Wars, cold planets and cold weather gear. And I got to see two Jedis in that gear. And it was just fun from that angle. Yeah, absolutely. Just aesthetically glorious. Uh, I got myself an action figure of Obi Wan from that yeah. episode in cold weather gear. Uh, it, the the hood when it's pulled up on in the episode has a little bit of "Don't speak to me" vibe, but the action figure really does. You can barely see Obi Wan's <laughs> face, <laughs> and it, it looks like Obi Wan in denial. It's just really like this is for being cold and also to truly communicate. Uh, do not speak to me. Right. <laughs> and yeah. I think for me, like. Um, my experience in Minnesota is, is, you know, you, you get really cold and it literally tightens you up. And some of that, you know, that like, 
Minnesota, Minneapolis socializes a ton in the winter in defiance of the cold. But the easy thing to do is to let the cold make you just go like, I just need to get home and I just need to be locked away. And, you know, it can kind of build this this energy of of tightness and and stay away from it all. And uh, I try to have a sense of humor about that and be aware of that in myself. And that Obi-Wan cold weather gear action figure from this episode is just so funny to me because it's got the like, ugh. I'm just going home after work. Thanks in for the invite to the party, but no. <laughs> you know what? I can go get a hut on a, a sand planet. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then in terms of what the actual story of this episode is, it's a, a story about, you know, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the species, the other uh, people uh, putting a, a claim to Ordo Plutonia and kind of trying to just take it over, right? Yeah. Um, but then we see the, the species that lives there, the tolls, uh, being victorious because they're totally in sync with the environment. So it's yet another perspective on these uh, ice planets that they're not just cold and forbidding like uh, Hoth is, that there are there are creatures who can be totally in tune with this environment. Yeah, learning to understand and uh, perhaps even love uh, where you are and who you are and, and uh, connection to it all. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a really nice and peaceful message when the Tulls absolutely clean the clocks of the Pantorans. <laughs> <laughs> a nice, peaceful message. Any other thoughts on that one? No, other than I, I think I need that cold weather gear figure. <laughs> okay, so this is one that you brought up right away when we were talking about uh, yeah. this episode, so I want to be sure to include it. Um, My Gito... And the murder of Kiati Mundi. That sounds like a fun mystery novel. So uh, this is a cold planet with bridges and cities and stuff. It's the homeworld of the Lerman. Uh, does it make Order 66 even harsher that Kiati Mundi died alone in the cold? Yeah, and this and this kind of being the 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 the, the big one to start it all off. You know, we spend the kind of, kind of the, the, out of that montage. This is one I feel that stands out the most, or we spend the most time there on it. Right, you get to see a little sequence and the music swell and playing, and it is this cold, distant land. And and uh, I absolutely think it just uh, is a, it's the indicator for this uh, the play that's about to be run. This uh, cold, distant. Uh, uh, thing and, and and on that bridge and and Kiati's face the turn and I know Kiati's made some mistakes in his life this this we know <laughs> but just that 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 just uh I don't know it's a, what do you call it a sigh a shrug a just acceptance but also man I can't believe this happened and almost like it all makes so sense and it's all there on that cold lonely bridge the whole thing about it works my Gita's always stood out to me uh the original Battlefront games there was a great level I think it might have been the original Battlefront 2 someone maybe can correct me I can't remember um had that map and it was, I just loved playing that one. And uh, we just don't spend enough time on it in the, in the movie, right? It's just this flash of the sequence, but I love, uh, I love that it's there and it's an underrated snowy setting. Yeah. I, I never uh, played that one. Did you spend a lot of time on the bridges? Did, did you play where Kiati Mundi died? Yeah, no, yeah, you are, you are on the bridges and you kind of see a little bit more of the city and you know, you get to, you know, explore the map a bit, but those bridges are there. You can fall off them. Very dangerous. No rails. <laughs> uh, the tanks are there. Everything's everything's there. And um, I think it just um, uh, one of the, that that battle that original Battlefront Two game. I, I just my love of uh, my current and always growing love of the prequels owes a lot to that game because the Mustafar map, the Magita map. It was just going. Man, maybe there's things about those movies I'm overlooking or not letting myself explore and enjoy. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, I, I love that as the first of the true montage of death, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. it's got, obviously there's the utter horror of Order 66, but it's also got this like little peek into what uh, Lucas always dreamed of, of the, um, yeah. of the Clone Wars, of like the way Revenge of the Sith is, you know, famously supposed to have started with seven battles on seven worlds. And <laughs> instead we see seven tragedies on, yeah, not quite seven, several tragedies on several worlds. And one of them is this, like, well, what is this? What's this, you know, cold, windswept uh, environment and nice. large bridge? It's, it's a cool environment, but it immediately does make you tighten up like the cold does. And, yeah, that that look on Kiati Mundi's face mm. when he kind of turns around and is like, well, why aren't they following me? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it does add to it that it's cold and windswept, that death. Um, I'm so excited to talk about this next one because I think it is really going to play into your art of getting warm. Yeah. And that is Vandor and Fort Ipso in Solo. We got some quality weather gear in these scenes. They're taking the cold seriously. Yes. Uh, 
What does that lodge atmosphere in particular add to the history of uh, cold planets in Star Wars? Well, you know, especially when we when we first um, go to Vandor and then seen it in all the trailers, you know, it's it's the conveyance, it's the action, it's the, the the it looks very Star Wars, just this barren land, and to know that there's people surviving. Uh, are they all, uh, you know, on the up and up? Yeah, some scoundrels there for sure. Um, but it just, I just, I love that it's, uh, it's uh, habitable. It, you can live there. You can find your way and get a good drink along the way, and maybe bet on some droids. We don't recommend that here. Um, some droid fights, but yeah, I just, oh, there's, I just love it. I love again. I, I love the way it was shot. I love uh, Bradford Young's work in Solo. I, I've always said it, it might be my favorite looking uh, of, of, of the Star Wars films. Um, his choice of uh, natural lighting and everything, everything about that, uh, you know, the Fort, Fort Ipso is just something um, so it's familiar, but it's so unique to, to Star Wars. It, it, it's that kind of that, that tension that, that we all love um, and, and talk about cold weather gear there. Yeah, absolutely. You got some great jackets in there. Lando, look yeah. at you. Yeah. Yeah. And Han's giant jacket. Come on. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> he is. He is bundled up for the cold, which is and great. Chewy. Yeah, I think. Hang on. And chewy. Yeah, obviously, always, always chewy with a little bit of snow in the uh, fur is. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, beautiful. Uh, yeah, I think for me, like you go back to Hoth and you get the like, oh, no, you'll die if you're outside for too long. But then you go inside and you're not that much warmer. <laughs> right. <laughs> or you see characters like the Tulls of like, this is our natural environment or uh, uh, Ilum, we're like, well, uh, it's it's it, it's something that we need to overcome. This taps into this great part of winter that I have fond memories of mm. in growing up in Minnesota, which is the respite. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the sigh of relief. It, it's nice to be warm because it's warm, mm -hmm. but it's something else entirely to have to know that feeling of I am just covered in layers. I am freezing. But I'm also drenched in sweat from being on, <laughs> under all those layers. And then the sweat froze. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's just this like there's this clamminess to your body. And then you you walk into a place that isn't just a break from the cold, that it is designed for warmth and comfort. Everything from the actual like fires mm. to that nice warm wood, that lodge look, that lighting, everything about that place is come in and take a break from the cold and be <laughs> like cozy warm right like the 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 whole lodge to me gives me like sense memories of like oh yeah going out sledding and then coming home to like a warm house and stripping away some of the layers and the, the cold is still there in your bones but on the outside you're warming up and you got some hot cocoa or some whiskey depending on your age and inclination you know? <laughs> yeah and your cheeks are still rosy and red the fingers got that little tingle of life returning to them oh, yeah, yeah the tingle of life returning that's what that lodge is to me and i there just love it oh uh, yeah yeah yeah, no, look, I, uh, you know, Batu is great. Galaxy's Edge is great. Like, can they open up one that's in the snow and give me four dips? So I'd be there. Oh, I would love that. Yeah. It, and it's, it's so an earthly lodge, but still very Star Wars at the same time. So great design. Moving on to another cold planet, planet and that is Kajimi. Mm. Uh, like we talked about, we don't see uh, any really different cold weather gear, but uh, 3PO wears a coat, and I'm waiting mm. for that action figure. Uh, what do you, this is another planet that has like a, a functioning civilization in a very cold place. Uh, wh what do you like about the vibe of Kajimi? There's a little bit of, um, I don't want to say they've all run away to live there. That's probably not fair to the people who maybe uh, didn't do that and were born and raised there. But it's on it's got that outskirts kind of vibe. Um, not unlike you go to a place, uh, you know, I use the example of L.A. It's one I know the most, but like. You know, you head two hours uh, outside of LA, and you're in Big Bear or Lake Arrowhead or something like that. It is, uh, it's, it's, it's so close, but it's not, and it's a different life. It's a different way of life. It's a different people. Uh, you know, um, and they, you know, they look at you like, oh, you a flatlander. Uh, you get those kind of reactions, but it's just, it's, it's their world. Uh, and I've, I like that about Kajimi. It's got a little bit of a village vibe where it just leaves where we see, right? Um, and it, and it's, uh, even when you fly in, I love the way the layout of it, uh, you know, when you're seeing them, seeing them, uh, approach it there in Ochi ship, uh, I just, uh, yeah. And it's got, it's probably, it's probably our best, might be one of our best locate locations for a uh, snert in star Wars at this point. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. It's a snerdy I city. It's a snerdy city. Beautiful, but a little dirty. 
it's yeah, a little bit of a snarty city. Yeah, I love seeing this urban community, right? Like clearly, mm. uh, everybody's cold, but everybody's hustling around, and kind of they you, you get to see uh, sadly some homes being invaded, uh, yeah. but you get to see some places of business, and it's you know it's the thieves' quarter, right? It's we know that it's maybe uh, from especially from expanded uh, storytelling in books that it is yeah, it is a little bit of a hideaway uh, mm. for people who don't want to be found, want to make a base in a kind of an isolated place. But it still has this almost uh, Dickensian Christmas Carol vibe, <laughs> yeah. Because it's it's a it's this dusting of snow and it's cold, but it's urban too. And and yeah. I think that's what was like really interesting and different to me. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. No, uh, uh, um, you know, and again, the bar's got a bar. It's got its own little uh, the tingling of a life returning vibe there. You know, it's got all of oh, it. Oh yeah. And- yeah, absolutely. It, it really makes me want to see like Thieves' Quarter uh, decorated with lights for Life Day. You know. Yes. And yes. I want to see uh, Oma Trace haunted uh, by bartenders of the past, present, and future. There you go. Yeah. So a lovely one. Uh, as we begin to wrap up, we are closing out with some of the most recent, uh, Jimmy's recent, but some of the most recent on television, uh, snowy, cold planets. Uh, we have Patagon or Patagon and Maldo Crease. So there was an error in an interview, but there are two different cold planets in the Mandalorian, it turns out. Mm. Uh, Patagon is in the first episode featuring those ice uh, taxis and that big monster, the Ravenac. And then Muldo Kreis is the ice planet uh, that frog lady and friends crash on <laughs> yeah. with the hot baths and the uh, pissed off spiders. So what what do these planets add to the lore of cold in Star Wars for you? It's 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 same kind of uh, you got a runaway vibe and just the dangers out there and you got to really be connected to it to to uh, to the land to survive it and, and and you can maybe find your way forward if you do so. Uh, um, uh, yeah, Patagon is uh, yeah. I, I I don't know if I ever need to go back to it, but I, I still think it's really interesting. Uh, it's it's a great way to start the series. Um, and we're not, you know, we're in this era of, uh, new Republic and we know kind of that the victory has been had and this series starts just on the far end of the cold forgotten parts of the galaxy. Um, love the use of that there. And, you know, plus, uh, seeing Brian Posehn and Star Wars, uh, always fun, <laughs> third old nineties, uh, and beyond comedy film. But Maldo Crisis is an interesting one to me because it just, uh, the, the, the speculation of, of it being, uh, Ilum. Uh, ran rampant and I loved it. And, uh, you know, our friend, uh, you know, Alex Damon was behind that as well. And, and, you know, not behind it, like he created the, the controversy, but like he just, he was all about that theory too. And I, I was too, I wanted to see it explore. Uh, but most likely we all kind of anticipated it would be something completely new, which I'm glad as well. But it just, again, drove home the fact that if you see something snow, uh, <laughs> it's got to be this just like Finn pops up in the Force Awakens teaser and sand and sand dunes and you're like that's got to be Tatooine and uh, I like that it's I like that it's Jakku I like that it's Maldo Kreese. Um, but it just shows that we love these environments and our attachment to these environments and snow and Star Wars is something that's big. Yeah, yeah, and expanding that palette. Yeah, I really agree with you about uh, Patogan, uh, mm. that it does such great storytelling. Right, it emphasizes the situation that uh, this is. Uh, cool but also just drudgery right that the mandalorian has to go way out to this incredibly remote place that looks like uh people are only kind of living there maybe for some practical reasons or to hide out right that yeah. mithril is hiding in this remote weird place and it looks like we've kind of managed to set up like a bit of community and a bit of way to function. I love that, that, you know, land speeder taxi gets called by that, uh, Kuba is blowing a weird horn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and then even then it's like, but it's not really practical because there are beasts everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so well done to use some recognizable parts of star Wars between land speeders and, uh, ice worlds, uh, and beasts and bars and just like, in a very short amount of time, it just throws a lot of the different Star Wars elements together. So it's it's such successful storytelling, I think. Yeah, great way to start the series. Yeah, and then the same thing for me with Maldo Crease is it just it's it's uh, definitely the the Hoth brand of Snow Planet. I think where it's like this is only making everything harder. 
<laughs> that one was really relatable to me of like, uh, I related to the Mandalorian when his vehicle uh, was uh, trapped in <laughs> snow and ice and it was not going to move. It's like starting a Ford Fairmont in a winter of uh, 94 or something like that, right? Yeah. If I could call the New Republic as AAA, you know, well, I guess I mean, he didn't call them. They they were looking for him. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so it's got that vibe of just like, this is an impediment. <laughs> yeah. To existence. I did not mean to get stuck here. But then I love seeing that it's got some hot water baths. That's cool. But then, of course, the the big feature of Malto Cruz as we've seen it is, you know, the spiders everywhere, mm. the ice spiders, which are just, again, so high fantasy. And I think ultimately for me, I really like that reminder of uh, everywhere is somebody's home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's not that's not the home for me, that one. So I'll, uh, I'll, nope. I'll, I'll pass. I can see a little meme in my mind of the uh, the wampa and the uh, the ice spiders, you know, shaking appendages and going yeah. like, yep, everywhere is somebody's home. And sometimes we don't want them there. Yeah, I'm not saying I'd survive a wampa, but I'd rather try than being chased by those horrible, horrible spiders. I cannot, sadly, leap like a frog, like Frog Lady yeah. does. So yeah, I would... Uh, <laughs> I could maybe duck a wampa. I could not escape the spider. So yeah. there you go. Yeah. Any other cold ice snow planets that you wanted to mention? Uh, none uh, None come to mind, right? I wouldn't mind. Uh, yeah. No, none come to mind. I wonder if there's any other locations that we just haven't seen at the other other time of the seasons. I mean, Endor, you know, I'm trying to remember some of the Ewok caravan and Kurt stuff. I can't remember if it was stowed in there. But I got to imagine there's some snow in Endor. I'd love to see Bright Tree Village at Life Day. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I think that's long been a joke of like, does any planet have seasons? Right. Is Hoth right. always that way? And yeah, yeah, definitely some of the places we've seen like, yeah, let's see them. Let's see them snowy here and there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the last one for me is uh, we just talked about the Clone Wars episode of Friend in Need uh, on the planet Carlac. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's a nice like, hey, there's communities here getting by. It's kind of more of a dusty snow vibe. Uh, but I bring it up just to say Ahsoka's winter weather coat is great. Uh, it absolutely is. Oh, you know what? Uh, Rebel Sabine, uh, her her house Ren. What's? Oh yeah, I love the the look there. It's very James Bondy. Like it's you're going out to meet a Bond villain in the snow. <laughs> uh, I, I love that one there. I'm I'm, I'm scrambling because I'm I'm so out of trivia practice, which is a, a nice relief to have in life. Um, of of her actual uh, the planet within Mandalore. But yes, yeah, nice. Cron is it Cronest? Is it Cronest? I think I typed uh, fast enough to see it. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, wh why don't you Google while we, uh, while we wrap up here, yeah. uh, the final question that I'm going to have for you, uh, once you're done with your Google fingers mm -hmm. is along the lines of what we we're talking about of like, look, uh, the, the winter celebrations come, uh, to many places. If you could celebrate life day on a snow planet, which of the many snow planets would you pick and why? I think I'd go at this point, I'd go to Fort, uh, Ipsel. On yeah. And the why is um, it has a little bit of vibe of your hometown bar that you're going to visit. So, you know, <laughs> the drinks are cheap. You might run into an old friend you want to see or maybe two you don't want to see, but you're going to be there uh, and uh, it, it, you don't have to stay long, but it's warm and cozy all at the same time. Yeah, and there's some kind of, there's some, looks like there's some bigger tables if you really want to socialize with a large group and some darker yeah. corners that you can go off to if you want to have a, a smaller conversation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to come up with a different answer, but that is for me absolutely the honest answer that it is yeah. so warm. It is so cozy. I want to drink there. It does have a hometown vibe. Whatever the Star Wars version is of being able to order a Paps Blue Ribbon tall boy and a shot of Jameson <laughs> is one order. They have that, right? That's the place. That's the place. Uh, uh, how are your Google fingers doing? Uh, we did. It is so does Crow Nest. Uh, 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 K R O W N E S T. Of course, he has the icy world um, that is a home to the ancestral home of House Wren. And uh, I love the design of that. I can't, I can't uh, you know, it, sometimes the newer stuff uh, f flies out of my brain a little easier than the stuff I grew up for 40 years. But um, love the look there. Like I said, it does. It does I'm, I'm expecting Daniel Craig to pop out with like some silencer on his uh, BP-7 and just be like, let's get to let's do a mission. Yeah. One of my my favorite James Bond jokes is uh, I've had people say to me like, you know, you know what James Bond movie I like? The one where he skis. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that doesn't narrow it down no. as much as you might think no. uh so yeah i totally get that vibe i'd love to see daniel craig uh, zipping by on his skis outside the compound on crow nest uh 
Well, that is our big look at ice and snow and cold in Star Wars. All the great aesthetics, all the great meanings, and all the different ways to enjoy or endure the cold. Uh, Ken, where can people find us? Hey, if you want to listen, follow, or uh, ask us a question for other episodes, you can do so by going to Twitter and uh, find us at Force Center Pod. We're on Instagram and YouTube as well. Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. Podcast available a lot of different spots, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, Amazon Music. And we're now here on ACAST merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. And we can be supported directly at patreon.com slash Force Center. Uh, you can uh, follow me at Ken Knapsack or go to my website, KenNapsack.com. Speaking of snow, I uh, will be in Washington, D.C. in mid to late December. Better get some hot gear for that trip doing comedy with Mark Ellis out at the Comedy Loft. <laughs> Tickets available on my website. Joseph, for you. Yeah, you can find me Twitter, Instagram, TikTok is at Joseph Scrimshaw, and you can check out uh, my website for all sorts of different comedy adventures, my uh, podcast, Obsessed, uh, some comedy albums. I have a holiday-themed comedy album, in fact, that uh, in- includes a bit called uh, Breaking Up With Snow. <laughs> and to anybody listening uh, who has lived in cold areas, lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota uh, area in particular, uh, is always want to highlight, uh, these are my life experiences, and I know many people have different life experiences Uh, my wife and I are not going uh, home to Minneapolis uh, this holiday season but now that I've talked about it so much Ken I kind of want to now I'm in the mood to try to endure the cold (laughs) and wear a cool scarf like Luke Skywalker so I look forward to the next opportunity to do that if you want to check out any of that stuff my website is just my name josephscrimshaw.com but for now for myself for Ken for all the wampas just trying to get by this has been Force Center